Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds, owner of Mint Mobile, with a message for everyone paying big wireless way too much. Please, for the love of everything good in this world, stop. With Mint, you can get premium wireless for just $15 a month. Of course, if you enjoy overpaying, no judgments, but that's weird. Okay, one judgment. Anyway, give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. New activation and upfront payment for three-month plan required. Taxes and fees extra. Additional restrictions apply. See mintmobile.com for full terms. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot? Do your thing however you cha-ching with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Get a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 23. Food Heals Podcast, episode 241. In order for you to be truly healthy, you must have knowledge of all areas of your life. So it includes nutrition and diving into digestion, but also your self-care practices, your morning ritual, your nighttime ritual, and also your environment and your relationships. And bigger than all of that, your dharma, your purpose. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In real cases, women have experienced a strong desire to stop asking their boyfriends if they look fat in this dress. If you experience any of these symptoms, post a selfie to Instagram immediately. All right, welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody, and I'm so excited to be chatting with Ayurveda expert Sahara Rose. Sahara is the best-selling author of The Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda, which is the number one number one people, best-selling Ayurveda book globally, and the upcoming Eat, Feel Fresh, a plant-based Ayurvedic cookbook. She has been called a leading voice for the millennial generation into the new paradigm shift by none other than Deepak Chopra, way to go girl, who wrote the foreword of both of her titles. But before we get to our interview with Sahara Rose, today is the last day to join us for our Rise and Bloom six-month mastermind. I love this quote. I wanted to read it to you that I came across. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. I mean, that just, uh, it gives me chills. It resonates with me so much. So if you want to up-level your business in 2019 with me and some other amazing wellness entrepreneurs, please join us for a high-vibe, high-end, six-month wellness mastermind. It's online, so you can take it anywhere in the world. It's going to be the fourth Wednesday of every month except January, which will be tomorrow is our first meeting. It's technically the fifth Wednesday, but it's going to be the fourth Wednesday of the rest of the month. It's going to be me, you, and other High Vibe Wellness Warriors. Food Heals Nation, this mastermind is for you if you're starting or building a business in the field of wellness, nutrition, holistic health, social justice, spirituality, creativity, exercise, yoga, animal rights, all that good stuff. If you need guidance on branding, marketing, video production, podcasting, writing, blogging, social media, and you're ready to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested, email me info at foodhealsnation.com. I'll get you all set up. And later in the show, you will hear from some other Rise and Bloom Mastermind members who are continuing on the next one. So they loved it so much. And I love you girls so much that they are joining us for 2019. And I hope you do too. Next up, Susie and I are interviewing Sahara Rose. The Food Hills Podcast starts now. She's a podcast host, world-renowned keynote speaker and teacher, best-selling author, world traveler, recipe developer, and recently got engaged in Bali. Please welcome Sahara Rose. Congratulations. Thank you guys so much. And that's an epic way to introduce me. (laughs) (laughs) Multifaceted. Can we hear about Bali first, just because? Yeah. I mean, I was in Bali by myself this past June. I'm writing my next book and I was already there for two weeks alone. It was like my second to last day. And my friend is like, I know a photographer, she'd love to do a photo shoot with you. So I'm like, okay, free content. So I went, was taking the picture. Someone pinched me from behind. I turn around and I see my 
then boyfriend. And I was like, wait, what? Am I hallucinating right now? And there he is on his knee proposing to me. And I'm just oh, like, oh. what is happening right now? I, I, I didn't even hear. I just kind of like blacked out because I had oh. been talking to this like shaman earlier. I was like, did she like sip, uh, slip some ayahuasca in my water or something? Like what is <laughs> happening? Like, And yeah, and then we got engaged and we ended up staying in Bali for longer and we're getting married in Hawaii next year. Wow. Congratulations. Awesome. What a great story. Thank you. Yeah. Very romantic of him. Oh my God. Mine is kind of similar, except I was with my husband, but he said it was around the holidays. And so we were at this winery. We had done this wine trip with a group of our friends and it was just before Christmas. And um, he was like, let's, I wanted to take a picture really bad to like make a holiday card. Like, you know, happy holidays from the engaged couple, you know, like everyone wants to do. Okay. Um, and so he's like, let's go take the picture. Let's go take the picture. I'm like, Dan is really into this picture. Like, what is, what is it? So he's like, let me take some of you. So he's like, has me turn around to like, look out on the winery at like the grapes and whatnot. And, and he's like, okay, look away. And I'm going to take some from behind. I'm like, okay. So he's clicking the camera and then he's like, okay, turn and face me. And I turn around and he's down on one knee with the Aww. ring. Aww. We got to give these guys some points. They're they're working hard. <laughs> pretty creative. But mine didn't fly to Bali. That is pretty impressive. <laughs> no, but that's beautiful. I love that story. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Sahara, we got the chance to meet in person at Whitney and Jason's amazing event. And that was so much fun. It was so great to be with like a like-minded group of people just trying to change the world of wellness. So for anyone who doesn't know, can you tell Food Heals Nation a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Sahara and I've written two books on Ayurveda, The Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda and Eat Feel Fresh, which is a contemporary plant-based Ayurvedic cookbook. And really my mission here is to modernize Ayurveda. For me, it started with my own health problems and I eventually found Ayurveda after trying so many different types of diets and healing treatments. And it really spoke to me, but at the same time, a lot of the practices were really old school and didn't make sense for today's time as well as weren't plant-based, which I have been since I was 15. So I really sought out a way to make it more modern and work for today's time and it didn't exist. So I decided I would go do it. And I wrote these books and they've gone on to become um, the two best-selling Ayurveda books nationwide. And it's just the beginning for this incredible health system to really reach so many people's lives, not just in physical health, but also mental health. Beautiful. I love it when something doesn't exist and we want it to exist, so we create it. Yes, that's what the human experience is all about, isn't it? Yes. And your foreword was written by Deepak Chopra. Yes, he wrote the foreword of um, both of my books and has been an incredible just mentor and inspiration for for me, even before I, I met him. He was someone that I've always looked up to, and it's really been an honor to work with him. That's so cool. So what is Ayurveda? Tell us everything. We haven't done a lot on this. I know Susie and I, like, I feel like we have talked about this. We haven't really gone in depth. We haven't gone in depth, no. Yeah. So let's go in depth. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend we're idiots since he wrote The Idiot's Guide. <laughs> yeah. So Ayurveda is the world's oldest health system, and it originated in ancient India over 5,000 years ago, and it's the sister science of yoga. So most people, when they go to a yoga class, they're going for a physical issue. They want to be more flexible, more balanced, etc., or a mental issue, anxiety, stress. But if you were actually practicing yoga for a mental or physical reason, you are not practicing yoga. Yoga is a spiritual practice. Right. Ayurveda is the sister science based off of balancing the mind and body. So really, we're practicing Ayurveda every day. We just didn't know it. We didn't have the terminology. So the word Ayurveda means the knowledge of life. In order for you to be truly healthy, you must have knowledge of all areas of your life. So it includes nutrition and diving into digestion, but also your self-care practices, your morning ritual, your nighttime ritual, and also your environment and your relationships. And bigger than all of that, your dharma, your purpose. So it really encompasses all of these different components. And it says, how can I really live my life customized to what I was born with and the reason why I was born with those things? 
That's so cool. And I love how it's much deeper than what people think. A lot of people think it's just about the doshas, which I definitely want to talk about. But I learned about it. I took a level one of uh, it was 200 hour, I believe, yoga teacher training. The specialization was yoga therapy. So healing the body with yoga. And in the mornings, we would do the physical practice. And in the evenings, we would do the Ayurvedic component of that. And I learned so much. And I just loved all the connections that I made by taking that course. And I, I didn't do it to become a yoga teacher. I did it for my own, you know, wellness, wealth of knowledge and just expand my own, you know, knowledge and wisdom in this world. And so can you talk a little bit about in terms of the doshas, what those are and how they play into like who we are as people? For sure. Yeah. So the word dosha means energy and we're all comprised of these three energy types and these three energies are based off of the five elements. So similar to Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine was actually based on Ayurveda. In year 600 AD, Chinese scholars came to northern India. They learned about Ayurveda, and then they created their own system. So it's also a five elemental system, but different elements. In Ayurveda, they are space, air, fire, water, and earth. And these five elements come together to create these three doshas, these three energies or archetypes. And they are vata, which is air and space, pitta, which is fire and water, and kapha, which is earth and water. So we are Mm -hmm. all a combination of all three of these doshas, but in varying amounts. And it's going to show up differently in your mind, in your body, but you'll be able to see kind of like the overlaps and the parallels. And we can talk about each dosha, but right now people may be like air in my body and fire in my mind. Like what could that mean? But it's actually super intuitive. And once you learn about these doshas, you're like judging everyone left and right. You know, like you're able to see these um, kind of like archetypes. It's like a personality test meets health and wellness. And that's what really drew me to Ayurveda because it was like health coaching and life coaching in one. The first one, Vata, is air and space energy. I like to just call it air energy because it's mostly air. So if I was like, ladies, I'm dating this guy. He's so airy. What do you think he's like? I think he's like granola. Mm -hmm. He's very like artistic. He's not like earthbound. He would be like um, kind of spur of the moment, go with the flow. He likes to hide, you know, maybe not a lot of rules. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So we're able to kind of already see that person in our minds. And what if I said, I feel like I have a lot of air in my stomach. What do you think that means? Burping. Burping. <laughs> what else? Allie? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I'm trying to think about what I would think. Air in my stomach. I feel like light, lighthearted. Yeah, you, you definitely lighthearted, but like literally air in my stomach would be gas, right? Oh, like, yeah. I'm bloated. I'm gassy. You just are holding too much air. Air in the joints. That's cracking joints. So it's really that that literal. So So if someone has a lot of air in their mind, as you guys both envision, that person is probably really creative. They think outside the box. They are artistic. They are a visionary. But the other side of that is with all of these ideas, the air is moving, it's flowing, it's, it's always regenerating. But sometimes when you're unable to ground your thoughts, you're not able to take action on them. Things can be up in the air, but you're not able to actually bring them down to earth. So you may be someone that has a lot of ideas, but not know how to implement it. And when the air manifests too much, that can lead to anxiety. Anxiety is essentially when your thoughts turn into a tornado and you're no longer in control of them. So anxiety, insomnia, these are two imbalances of vata in the mind. So creative, eccentric, visionary, but also possibly airy fairy, space cadet, head in the clouds. These same words we have in the English language would describe that vata mind. And then the body, the bloating, gas, constipation, the joints cracking, skin is cold, dry, as is the hair. Their digestion um, is slow. They tend to have a hard time breaking down foods. They're sometimes they're really hungry. Other times they're not. They, when hormonal system is essentially drying up, then you stop menstruating or your menstrual cycle is really far spaced apart. That's how I got into Ayurveda. I had such a bad vata imbalance. I didn't get my period for two years. I lost so much hair. I had really bad IBS-C. 
bloating, gas, constipation. I learned about Ayurveda. I learned about the Vata imbalance. And it was like, I was just reading my autobiography and it was the first time that I felt so understood, but no one had ever told me, you know, a gastroenterologist never asked me, how am I sleeping? And a therapist never asked me about my gut and the hormone person never asked me about my digestion. And in right. the Western world, we kind of look at these parts as really acute, but in Ayurveda, you look at them all as interconnected. So the vata imbalance would be excess air mentally, physically, emotionally. So if you just think, what would air look like in that part of me? There you have what vata looks like. I remember vata. Um, one of the things that I learned in um, class was they went to bed at different times every night. And I'm like, that is so me because I feel like most people I talk to are very regimented about their sleep. And I, I go to bed at a different time every night. And that was one that stuck out for me that there are these very specific characteristics of vata, pitta and kapha that are really fascinating when you break them down. Yeah. Vata, everything is invariable. You'll never guess, just like you can never guess the direction the wind is going to blow. So a Vata person, and I still do this, you eat at different times of day. You sleep at different times of the day. You don't like to have a set schedule. In fact, that can feel really heavy for you because you want to be light and airy and free and able to be spontaneous. <laughs> so like a Pitta person, which is the next, the fire dosha, like they, they have their regimen. I eat at 1 p.m. I finish at 2. Like This is what my life looks like. And like they like to stick to that. Um, yeah. Whereas Vatas, they really need that creativity and that freedom, which is a good thing. But sometimes you need that grounding and that structure. So actually, Vatas really are supposed to eat and sleep at the same times every day because that routine allows their body to pretty much understand when you're going to eat before the digestive process begins. So it can create the digestive environment that you need to adequately break down those foods. Whereas if you're eating at different times of the day, it's just like if you're sleeping at different times, your body doesn't know when that you're going to eat or sleep and it's not going to be prepared for that thing. So though it feels really heavy and boring, Vantas really thrive off of routine. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I know that to be true for myself because I am very unroutine. I am very, I need my freedom. I can't be tied down to a schedule. I'm, I can never hold down a nine to five, never have, never will, you know, all of those things. But when I do follow a regular routine, like, okay, I'm going to Pilates every single day at this time. I'm going to eat lunch, like all of the things I'm going to schedule. Like I only do podcast interviews on certain days of the week, things like that. The more regimented I am, the more freedom I actually can create. But sometimes it's hard to see that when you're just like, I don't want to make plans. <laughs> Mm, totally, exactly. So it's like a, a mixture of, of nature and nurture, right? Like we're born with different qualities, but then we can change things about ourselves, but we don't want to totally change everything about ourselves. So that's what Vata looks like. And, you know, it goes very, very deep. We could look at it in every type of way, but really just look at cold, dry, and variable, scattered. Um, and that's really what, what that looks like. Now for Pitta, Pitta is a lot of fire energy. So if I was like, ooh, that girl is super fiery, what do you think she's like? She's like feisty, maybe a bit aggressive. She's always got a lot of energy, you know, not afraid to express herself. Argumentative. Argumentative, like just like look at me, like walk into a room and wants attention, not a wallflower. Those are the things. Mm -hmm. that are Driven. Driven, Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So she has that fire. She's definitely driven, goal oriented. She gets what she wants. But what happens when things don't go her way? She's not happy. She burns. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> she burns. <laughs> and everyone around her suffers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with all that fire, so fire is, is sharp. I mean, we're experiencing this fire here. Like fire can break down anything. It is a very, very powerful energy. And especially when paired with water, that's what Pitta is. It's both fire and water, which are the two most powerful elements. So Pitta people, they really are. They have that CEO, that boss type personality. They're structured, they're routine, they're able to lead a team efficiently, they're able to keep emotions out of it and just be like, okay, this is what we need to do and we're, we're going to do it. It almost has that warrior-like energy. So that's why we see a lot of people in, in leadership positions like politicians or just people who own big companies, they tend to have a lot of pitta. 
for example, if you look at Gary V, if you guys follow him, very Pitta. Like yeah. that's just a good example of one. Whereas <laughs> Steve Jobs is very Vata. Like he's in his head and he's thinking and he's creating things. And he also has the very Vata body. Vatas tend to be really tall and lean and gaunt faces. And so Steve Jobs, Ashton Kutcher, Kira Knightley, Natalie Portman, very Vata. Pitta is more strong, structured, athletic. So think, yeah, Gary V, Jennifer Aniston, Madonna, Jennifer Lopez, Kobe Bryant. Kobe's kind of looks Pitta Vata actually, but that type of physique. So even in sports nutrition, I studied sports nutrition in school and we have ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph. Like This is literally Vata Pitta Kapha. But Ayurveda just kind of takes it a step further from just physiology into other characteristics as well. So it's really fascinating. Yeah, I was about to say that. It's really fascinating. I love learning about this stuff. Okay, what about Kapha? Yeah, so I'll first give a little synopsis on Pitta. So Pitta, fire in the mind. When things don't go their way, they can snap. That fire can turn into a volcano. So they really need to work on cooling down, taking it easy. And my two mantras for Pittas are trust and surrender. If they can learn those two things, they can be so powerful. But sometimes they try to control everything. And life has a different plan for us sometimes. And we can't totally hold on to the rain. So they really need to learn to move with the water more, connect to that part of them. And then in the body, you have too much fire in your digestion. What do you think that's like? Maybe you have like acid diarrhea. <laughs> what you say, Susie? Both, both, are, both are correct. Yes. We both so, win. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have too much fire in Ayurveda, we call your digestion an agni, which literally means your internal fire. So if your fire is burning too strong, you're going to be pretty much burning through food. So it'll move right through you. That's the diarrhea. But also when you're creating excess acid that moves up your esophagus, you're experiencing heartburn. Your heart is burning. We even say this in English. So anything related to hyperacidity is pitta related, as well as any irritation, inflammation, hives, rashes, rosacea, acne. These are all symptoms of the excess heat in your system that's kind of like throwing you off, right? So if you see someone that they have just like red inflamed skin, there's a pitta imbalance going on. And that's why we see a lot of teenage like boys, especially like they are in the winter time and like on the East coast in shorts and shirts and and they're not cold at all. And then you also see that's when the acne is most prevalent at those times because they're highest, they're in the pitta stages of their lives and they have so much energy and they need to run around. So they need to move more into the kapha, the earth element. I love this because once you realize you can then make these changes so that you can heal these things. I love this. Okay. Kapha. Yes. So kapha is earth energy. So do you guys ever have guests on your podcast that talk a little bit more like this all the time um yes and then i have to politely (laughs) hang up on them i'm just kidding (laughs) (laughs) so if i did the entire interview like this mm, i was just at this talk last week and eckhart tolle was was speaking and he is so cough like there were just so many spaces between he talked and i'm very vata so i was like oh my god what do you want to say and that cough it's very luxurious it takes its time it moves slow so if you have a lot of cough in your mind you're someone that you are calm you're peaceful you don't get stressed out over things like you're sitting in traffic and you're like "Mm, i'm not gonna worry about it I'm going to get there when I need to get there, which is amazing. I like to think kaffas, their their mottos are like hakuna matata. Like they just, they just take it so easy. Must so, be nice. I, I have yeah. a lot to learn. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Same. <laughs> With that kaffa energy, you have mother-like characteristics, just like the earth. The earth is constantly giving us food, water, oil, gas, like whatever we need. Earth is like, I got you. But what happens is you end up taking, you take advantage, you take too much. And that's what happens with Kapha people. They often end up giving, 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 and then they end up depleted. Mm -hmm. So Kapha people need to really work on setting boundaries. They need to work on filling up their own cup. Because if you're constantly trying to make everyone else around you satisfied, you're just going to end up leaving yourself unsatisfied. And then in the body, that excess earth energy makes you feel 
heavy. It makes you feel lethargic. So if you wake up in the morning and you feel like you have no energy or you feel like you're gaining weight, emotional eating, these are all symptoms of a kapha imbalance. So what you really need is to shake things up. You need to get out of your routine, out of your comfort zone, get your body moving, stimulate yourself, go to that exercise class that may be overwhelming for you or scary for you because that is the only way that you're going to be able to learn and grow and experience more of the pitta and more of the fire. So really what we're seeking in Ayurveda is to bring out the doshas that we are lacking in so we can become balanced. I was just quick question. So Hara, aren't we like one of like one of these is our main dosha and then we have like a secondary? Aren't we combos a little bit? So we're actually all all three all doshas. Th- oh, okay. So Yeah. So you're all all three doshas, but in varying amounts. So you may be born primarily vata, secondarily pitta, lastly kapha, or any other combination. You may have two that are really close. 10% of people are pretty close in all three as well. That's called sama agni. You're equal in all three. So you may have periods of your life that you're more pitta, more pitta years, more pitta months, more pitta days. You may have more kapha periods in your life. You're, we're each born with a unique combination of all three called our prakriti, which is our natural born constitution. But in our life, our diet, lifestyle, exercise, et cetera, that can change those things. So again, it's like nature versus nurture, and that's called our vikruti. So for example, you may go through a difficult divorce, and in that divorce, you are staying home, you're eating more, you're not leaving the house, and that triggers a kapha imbalance. So you may not have been born kapha, but you're experiencing all of the kapha imbalances because you've shifted the pendulum too much in that direction. So we can definitely... Ex- I've had all three imbalances at different points in my life. So you're not just stuck with one, and that's like forever your label. We're all going to relate to all three. You just may have like that set one that you go to. You may have your set two that you go to, but we all have the facets of all three. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I've taken the quiz, you know, there's quizzes online. What's your dosha multiple times throughout my life. And I've gotten different results, even from taking the same quiz. Cause I've been in a different place in my life at that time. And, you know, just if you listen back to everything you just talked about, there was something I personally could relate to in every dosha that you mentioned. Suzy, did you feel the same? Yeah, totally. Uh, and, and certainly like I was thinking about all the people <laughs> so, like, trying to like, what's my husband? Oh, that reminds me of this person. But then like, I certainly can relate to cer- even certain, p- certain times of my life and then certain parts of my body. And then like, yeah, it totally makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have a quiz on your site. I do. Yeah. On my website, I am saharrose.com. And I've made mine a little different. I've broken down the dosha in the mind and the dosha in the body. So you're able to see exact percentages of what am I physically, what am I mentally, because sometimes they're different. And that really throws people off because they're like, what do I practice if I'm relating to two different ones? So follow the diet, the, the physical suggestions for what's going on in your body, and then follow the lifestyle and the more meditative suggestions for your mind. So in America, the most common imbalances that we see are kapha in the body. You're feeling too stuck, too sedentary, too heavy. You're gaining weight. But then vata in the mind, you're anxious. You're unable to settle. You're unable to rest. And that's because of our our culture as well. We're always multitasking. So what you would do is you would do more of the stimulating diet, more spices, stimulating activity for for the body. But in the mind, I wouldn't overly stimulate yourself. I would do more meditative practices, mindful walking, things that are going to help bring more stillness in the mind. Yeah, this I feel like this describes so many people in, in in the modern day because we're bombarded with you know stress and technology and people needing to get in touch with us in ways that never existed before. And it's like there's always so much to do. We're always so stressed, so we become these like overly stimulated people with way too much on their to do list, balancing work, family, personal, all of the things, and then our bodies are getting physically exhausted by it. So instead of being able to handle it, our bodies go almost into a depression where we're like, our minds are firing, but our body's like, I just can't. (laughs) I'm overwhelmed. Totally. I mean, the internet, like, how can you get more Vata than that? It's like, we're communicating over cyberspace and no one's really there. And there's so many things and inboxes and it's so up in the air. And that's why in our culture, we're almost like lacking physical contact, physical touch. We ghost each other on dates. Like this is all this like excess crazy Vata-ness. And what we really need is to 
what we're all craving, though we don't want to admit, is the cough. It's to take things more slow. But we have such fear in our society that if I take things slow and I take a rest, then everyone's going to surpass me and I'm going to fall behind. So what would it be like if we all moved into that direction and really trust that everything will be done in the right time and I don't need to do it all right now? I blame the smartphone. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's, all, it's all that Vata Steve Jobs' fault. <laughs> well, you know what? No, you guys laugh, but like, honestly, I, th- I'm th- I think about this more and more. It's like, yeah, we, we create technology to try to make lives better and easier and faster, et cetera. But at the same time, we're not, it's happening so quickly that- At what cost? At yeah. what cost? And then it's like, we feel like we have to do things like, we're not consciously being like, what is this doing to our, but maybe some of us are, but not, not enough people. There's documentaries on how um, social media is just, made to grab our, our attention. It's almost as addictive as as drugs. And it's like, we have to take a step back and go, yeah, w- maybe I'll do that, but I won't do this or I won't engage in that or I'll limit my my time on social media or whatever or my smartphone or I'll check my, you know, we're not setting boundaries for ourselves. We're becoming slaves to our technology and that is not good for our health. Absolutely. Food Heals Nation, this is the last time you're going to hear me talk about it on the podcast, probably for the next six months. If you want to join our six-month Rise and Bloom Mastermind, let me know. Email me at info at foodhealsnation.com because we start tomorrow. I'm so excited because we have so many return members from the last one, and we just have so much fun. We really support each other, and we really help each other with ideas, and we're learning from the best. So you're not only learning from me about one of my favorite things to talk about, podcasting, but you're really learning from other experts in the fields of marketing and monetization and really learning how to monetize your passions so that you can truly do what you love and help others at the same time. So I have three testimonials for you. Roxy is going to roll right now from three of my favorite Rise and Bloom members who were in the mastermind last time and are also in the new mastermind. We've got Chris from Elevate Your Eight. We've got Marina from Soul in the Raw, and we've got Alana from Sprouts and Krauts. Follow them on Instagram right now. Roll it, Roxy. Hi there. My name is Chris McPeak. I'm the executive director of Silver Peak Performance, and I'm the CEO of Silver Peak Development. And I'm here today to tell you about my experience with the Rise and Bloom Mastermind series facilitated by Allison Melody. Back in April, I attended the day-long hot seat experience at her home in West Hollywood, and I left that experience with a wealth of information, I can't even begin to tell you how important and special it was to me. Um, having completed that um, experience with Allison as my leader, I was able to finish and publish and market my second book. I was able to land a book signing of that second book at a national conference. I launched my first ever podcast, which is called Elevate Your Eight. And I'm on track now to launch my first group coaching program called Career Bliss. I've just finished the five-week program that Allison facilitated online, another Rise and Bloom mastermind. And while I can't give you results from that one yet, I can tell you that it was an extremely powerful experience these past five weeks. Um, If you have any doubts about whether or not to participate in Allison's programs, I'm just going to cast that all away from you right now. Just effing do it. You will not be sorry. It will change your life. It will change your reality. It will change the way you look at your business and the way you network with others. So don't waste time. Sign up today. I'm not kidding. You will not be sorry. For real. Thanks. Hi, my name is Marina and I am a plant-based health coach and blogger at Soul in the Raw. And I participated in Ali's mastermind that just ended and I'm so excited to do the next one. Um, I am a very skeptical person. I don't enroll in things easily. And I was actually on Ali's podcast. So I saw that she was doing the mastermind and I was like, "Mm, I don't know. And then I asked her a million questions and who's going to be in there? and What are you going to do? And all these things. And I had no idea what it was going to be like, but I had a weird intuition that it's a good thing to do. And seriously, I don't spend money easily, but... I had this intuition, so I had to enroll, and I did. 
and it was incredible and that's why I'm so excited for the next one because I learned so much and the general vibe that I get from Ali is that she knows what she's talking about it's not just you know all these crazy strategies because honestly I've been around for four years in my business and I always hear about this strategy and that strategy and you know these shortcuts and you know that you can do and that is not how it was I felt like every suggestion that she had and every lesson that she taught us and she taught so much it was like non-stop information but so productive was so effective and efficient it was all about optimizing the things that you're doing to get the most out of it which is so awesome and she's also such a wonderful person I feel like whenever one of us needed help she was always there she was always sharing her resources and what worked for her and her awesome successful business so it was freaking amazing and I cannot recommend it enough for any of you to join the next one please join us it's so worth it it's so much fun and it's also so fun just getting to know all the participants that are doing it and learning from each other so can't recommend this enough and I hope that you enroll Hi, my name is Alana Halden, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit about my recent experience with Alice and Melody's Rise and Bloom Mastermind. I'm a vegan chef, and I recently started a food blog called Sprouts and Krauts. After designing my website, getting it up and running, and starting to create content, I quickly came to a standstill. I realized I didn't really know how to actually get my message out there and reach my intended audience, which got frustrating pretty quickly. Around that time, I happened to hear about Rise and Bloom, and I feel so lucky that I did. It was an amazing experience to take part in, and I feel like I came away with it with so many more tools and strategies that I can now implement in my business. From Instagram strategies, sponsorships, and sales funnels, to email lists, online courses, and podcasts, Allison has a wealth of information to share. And on top of her own expertise, she also brought in several experts to really delve into other areas like Facebook advertising strategies and how to write and self-publish your own books. So to anyone thinking about signing up for the upcoming Rise and Bloom Mastermind, I would highly recommend it. Thanks, ladies. I am so obsessed with all of you. We've had a really good time doing this mastermind. I'm so excited to continue with you. Cheers to 2019. And if you're listening right now and you want to take your wellness business to the next level in 2019 and create a community of like-minded ladies and guys are invited to, just shoot me an email at info at foodhealsnation.com. All right, now back to our interview with Sahara. You're listening to the Food Hills Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. Okay, so I'm taking the quiz, and as I go through it, I answer the questions. And then when I get my results, there'll be food recommendations. There'll be, like, tell us what we do once we figure out the doshas so that we can thrive in our lives. Yeah. So it gives you both food and, and lifestyle recommendations. So for Vata, if you're having a Vata imbalance, the bloating, gas, constipation, what you really need are more warm foods, grounding foods, root vegetables, sweet potato, butternut squash, things that literally are grown under the ground and staying away from excess cold food. So don't just have smoothies and salads and kale chips and granola bars and foods that like the health food community is like labeled as this is healthy because that's going to cause more of a vata imbalance, which again is the most common, especially with like health conscious women, because we think that just going on juice cleanses and eating salads all day is the best thing that we can do. And we need more warming foods, especially in the winter time. So go for the warming foods, the grounding foods, cook your foods, especially if you're noticing you're feeling bloated. Now, if you have too much pitta, too much heat in your system, the hyperacidity, rashes, rosacea, feeling irritated, you need more cooling foods. So this doesn't mean 100% raw, though you can eat raw foods and they will be good for you, but doing more leafy greens, more coconut products like coconut oil, coconut water, coconut milk, Brussels sprouts, bitter vegetables. These foods are going to be really cooling, really alkalizing because your body is, is too acidic and staying away from anything that's too spicy because that's going to heat up your body more. So don't put on the hot sauce and sriracha on everything. Instead, opt for more cooling foods. 
I remember I went through something similar where I decided that, and I, you know, I had done a lot of research and had interviewed a lot of people. This is years ago that the most anti-cancer diet was a raw food, whole foods, plant-based diet, which is true. However, I refused to cook my food for months and I thought I was being so super healthy and look, it's a healthy diet. However, my body was not thriving because it was craving warm foods. And it took me going to an acupuncturist and discovering that she did whatever magic the acupuncturists do. I don't remember at this point, (laughs) Um, but figured out that my body was craving warm food. And she was like, it's okay to cook your vegetables. And I had to come back from, you know, my hardcore belief that, oh, the raw food diet was the only diet for me at that time. And I've experimented on myself a million times, but I had to learn to incorporate warm food, cold food, and do what was right for me at the time. Also based on the time of year, based on where I was in my life and the time of year. Well, you know, what's super interesting as far as as what I understand about um, ancient Chinese medicine as well as Ayurveda is that they don't have anything raw. I, I can, I'm speaking more for Chinese. I don't, they cook all of their vegetables. And I believe in Indian cuisine too, they don't really eat raw stuff. So how am I wrong? Yeah. So that was one of the main things that I, I changed in my book, Eat, Feel Fresh, that in India, you can eat raw foods because you'll become sick. There's so many um, parasites and bacteria in the soil, which is why I used to live in India. I studied Ayurveda for two years there. And when I would eat raw foods, they used to call me the cow because they had never seen someone <laughs> eat raw foods before. Like they're like, yeah. you're just eating <laughs> leaves from a tree? Like what? And then I had to understand because you will become sick there. And I had become yeah. sick there. Yeah. Whereas in other ancient cultures, they have been eating raw foods for just as long. So I think that we're kind of take, we have to look look at Ayurveda and take the guidelines, but still incorporate it for today's time. So I think that you can eat raw foods if you can digest them. If you're feeling like super bloated and gassy after raw foods, then no, you're not digesting them. But if you feel great, you have more pitta in your body, then that really works. Kaphas can eat some raw, but not totally. It's more of the pittas. They do the best with it. Kaphas need to go for really stimulating foods like lots of spices, um, not necessarily hot sauce. That's not good for for anyone, but like cumin, turmeric, ginger, asafoetida, things that are going to kind of rev up their metabolisms because that gets them more stimulated and excited and energized. And that's what they need. So it's interesting because the ancient Ayurvedic approach was created in India and we didn't have refrigerators in ancient India. There were a lot of things that were very different. So we have to take a look at it from today's day and age. Like one part of Ayurveda says, don't eat food that was cooked more than three hours ago. Well, that made sense if you don't have a refrigerator and it's 120 degree India. Or another says, don't eat any mushrooms. And I always wondered because in Northern Indian cuisine, there's a lot of mushrooms. And then I found out that was from the British rule. When the British rule came and ruled over India for over a century, they saw there were a lot of psychedelic mushrooms growing and they didn't want people to ingest the psychedelic mushrooms. So they said, mushrooms are poisonous. They're going to make you fall asleep and you won't be able to wake up. Wow. So it became sort of this like, like housewife thing of like, don't eat mushrooms. They're really dangerous. And also India, and especially in warmer climates, you you should not eat just mushrooms you're finding off the ground. That actually is poisonous. All mushrooms became this forbidden thing. Whereas as we know, there are a lot of medicinal mushrooms. So in Eat, Feel Fresh, I'm like, okay, what does traditional Ayurveda say? And what makes sense for 20... 19 now. And how can we take the best of both worlds? I love that approach. Thank you for making it easy. And you have the idiot's guide. Like, thank you for making it easy and digestible for us. And before we wrap up, can you just give us a couple of self-care Ayurvedic tips. I know that I do some of these things that I didn't even realize were based in Ayurveda, like oil pulling and scraping the tongue and dry brushing the skin. Can you tell us some tips that anyone can incorporate no matter what dosha they are? Yes. So the four that I recommend are tongue scraping. Tongue scraping is to take a little U-shaped device called a tongue scraper and to scrape your tongue in the morning. And this actually helps with your digestion. It's more than just a mouth refresher. The reason why is because we begin digesting our food the moment that food enters our mouth. In fact, our tongue has receptors that tells us the exact digestive enzymes needed to break down the food. So when our tongue is coated in the white mucus, which we call ama in in Ayurveda, our tongue is not able to have as strong of a communication with our gut because it's not able to see 
what we are eating. So when you scrape your tongue, you're actually helping this this mouth gut connection because you're making it more clear for your body to understand what you're eating. So scraping your tongue, once you start doing it, you're never going to go back. It's actually like an addiction of mine now because I'm able to see so much. I learn so much about myself from my tongue. If I have cracks on my tongue, it's a Vata imbalance. If I have a red tip on my tongue, it's a Pitts imbalance. If I have a lot of white, just like big white coat, that's a cough imbalance. So having a relationship with your tongue is very, very important in Ayurveda. And it's in Chinese medicine too, because they, they learned it from Ayurveda. So it is an age-old practice and something that we can all do. It's not as complicated as, as we think. And even if we just go with those three rules and look at our tongues like that, we're going to be able to learn more and more about ourselves. So tongue scraping, oil pulling, which is basically Ayurvedic mouthwash. It's to take a spoonful of oil, sesame oil, if it's winter, more vata season, coconut oil, if it's pitta, more summer season. Um, you can do mustard seed oil or grapeseed oil for kapha or switch in between the sesame and coconut oil depending on the season. And you take a spoon of that, swish it around your mouth. You do not need to do it for 20 minutes. I think that (sighs) one person came in and said, you need to do it for 20 minutes. And like every magazine since then has said you need to do it for 20 minutes. Like I've asked my Ayurvedic teachers in India, like, is that true? And they're like, no, you can do it for three minutes. You can do it for five minutes. You do it for one minute. The optimal would be 20 minutes, but also the optimal would be to meditate for three hours a day. And we're not doing that either. So don't worry about it. And you don't need to stare at your face in the mirror the whole 20 minutes. You can you can move on. I'm boiling my water. I'm getting ready for the day and the oil's in my mouth. It's in there for like five minutes and I spit it out. And when you spit it out, spit it into a trash can because it will clog your plumbing if you uh, spit it out into your sink. And you'll notice that when you spit it out, it's like kind of foamy. It's like white and foamy. It doesn't actually look like oil anymore. And that is believed to be the toxins that are being pulled from your system. So it can very much destroy your plumbing. So just spit it out into a trash can, follow it up with some warm water or better yet, warm water and salt to kill any bacteria that's left over. And oil pulling helps remove the bad bacteria without damaging the good. When we have something like Listerine or any kind of antibacterial mouthwash, it's like an antibiotic. It kills everything, good and bad. And that's why people become addicted to antibacterial mouthwash and they feel like they can't go a day without it because their breath will smell so bad. Well, that's because they're killing both good and bad and then the bad Grows. So doing the oil pulling, it's a lot more gentle. You're not going to feel Listerine fresh right after, but it's allowing you to kill the bad bacteria while still maintaining your natural flora of your mouth. We have floras of our mouths as, as well as our guts, as well as our skin. So oil pulling is a really good place. And then for night, I recommend dry brushing, which is to take a loofah pretty much and to brush your skin while it's still dry. Always move upwards, moving towards your heart on your elbows and knees, round places, move in circular motions. And this helps remove the dead skin cells from your skin. So you're able to better absorb the oil, which we follow it up by abhyanga, which means self-oil massage. Again, you can use the sesame or the coconut or grapeseed, mustard seed, etc. And we oil our bodies. The word oil in Ayurveda is sneha, which means love. So when you oil yourself, you're actually loving yourself. It's a self-love practice as well as it stimulates your lymphatic drainage system. It helps with blood circulation. So you want to be kind of moving a little bit more vigorously, not just like, you know, the two second, like, okay, I put oil in my body, like running out of the house. It's actually to really hone in and see, okay, where am I dry? Like, what are the areas of my body that I need more oil? And if you can follow it up by a warm shower to let the oil like really absorb in your skin or a steam bath or sauna. That's what they do in in Ayurvedic Panchakarma centers. It's called Svedana. So that allows the oil to further absorb. And then if you take the shower, then you can apply a little bit of oil after. You probably won't need that much because it's fully absorbed in your skin. So most people, we do oil only after the shower. So I recommend before you take a shower, try the dry brushing and put the oil on your skin before you take a shower. And you're going to notice your skin is actually absorbing the oil so much more. You're not going to be like getting all your clothes oily, your furniture dirty, um, because the oil's actually gone into your skin. It's not just like sitting on the surface. So these are four Ayurvedic practices that everyone can benefit from. Again, you can change the oil, sesame in the winter, coconut in the summer, moving both for kaphas and everyone will feel so much better, not just physically, but also mentally. And it's affordable, it's easy, and it's something you can practice for the rest of your life. 
I love these tips and you don't have to go buy the latest $100 anti-aging cream when you have tips like this. Like these are the tricks to staying healthy. And I will give a quick testimonial for tongue scraping. So here I am, I eat an organic plant-based diet. I drink smoothies all day, big salads. Like I'm the epitome of like, I do all the things. Okay. Then there's my husband who doesn't do any of the things, but swears by the tongue scraping. And he also swears by flossing. The man never gets sick. He sleeps less hours than me. He's more productive than me. Like I'm telling you guys, there is something to the tongue scraping that really is good for the help with digestion, the immune boosting, like all of the things that we need, like you can do very simply. And the oil pulling as well, I think is super powerful. And no, I have never done it for 20 minutes. It starts to actually make me feel like I'm in a gag. So I have to spit it out within three minutes, but just go as long as you can, because it's going to pull out the toxins. It's a great addition to your mouth care routine because everything you do to your mouth is actually affecting your internal organs and your body. So it's not just about your teeth and your breath and your tongue. It's actually about your entire immune system and boosting that. So those are such great tips, Sahara. I really appreciate you. Oh, of course. Yeah. So I think everyone, once they start doing it, even if it's just one practice, try one practice this week. And then maybe you add another one the week after. It doesn't have to all be at once. It can be really gradual because that way it's going to stick with you for the rest of your life. Yes. And the dry brushing feels so good. I crave it. I crave it. I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, I need a dry brush. Like it feels so good. It's like a mini massage. I know. It's so good. All right, Sahara. Well, thank you so much for being here today. We haven't talked about your podcast, so we'd love to give your podcast a shout out. Tell us about your books one more time and where everyone can find you online. Yeah. So the best place to start is my quiz. I am sahararose.com. Take the dosha quiz. I'll send you a free three-day mini course. My book is called Eat, Feel Fresh. It's available wherever books are sold. It has over a hundred plant-based contemporary Ayurvedic recipes, including ingredients from around the world. So it's not just Indian food. And if you really want to just learn everything about Ayurveda from self-care practices, chakras, all of that stuff, check out Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda, which is also wherever books are sold. My podcast is called Highest Self Podcast. It looks at Ayurveda as well as spirituality and consciousness and all areas of life. And if you guys have Instagram, my Instagram is at I am Sahara Rose. If you found me here on Food Heals, send me a DM. I would love to hear from you. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Sahara. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. All right. We'll see you next time, Food Heals Nation. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to change their status update from hashtag blessed to hashtag OMG even more blessed than yesterday, hashtag loving life. If you experience any of these symptoms, make sure to tweet a Kardashian immediately.